and start uh, recording that. Bom, gente, uh, boa tarde. Então, vamos começar mais um FAPS, esse Fórum de Atualização e Pesquisas Semióticas, que é uma, é uma das atividades do Jesus, que é o Grupo de Pesquisas Semióticas da, da USP. E hoje, nesse FAPS de setembro, temos a imensa alegria, a honra, de contar com a participação do professor Nick Suzanes, que, bom, eu acho que ele já é fartamente conhecido de todo mundo que está aqui, mas, de todo modo, é, o professor Nick Suzanes é, da, é, é professor na San Francisco State University, ele é vencedor do prêmio Will Wisner, de 2018, autor de histórias em quadrinhos, é professor associado de Humanities and Liberal Studies nessa, na San Francisco State University, onde coordena um programa de estudos interdisciplinares sobre HQ. É o autor do álbum Unflattening, o Desaplanar, que está aqui. É, Desaplanar é a tradução desse álbum Unflattening é, para o português, feita pelo Érico Assis e que foi originalmente sua tese de doutorado inteiramente desenhada sob a forma de quadrinhos. Né? Então, essa, essa tese ela foi publicada é, pela Harvard University Press em 2015, traduzida em várias línguas, é, ganhou vários prêmios, enfim. É, foi um, um pequeno acontecimento, vamos dizer assim. Eu, eu acho que eu caí? Não. Foi um pequeno... Ah, não, estou aqui. É, foi um pequeno acontecimento, vamos dizer assim, o fato de, de existir né, essa tese em quadrinhos é, e que foi defendida na Columbia University e que, então, abre, vamos dizer assim, o, as, as portas né, para uma melhor, uma melhor aceitação dos quadrinhos na academia é, como... É, algo passível de estudos, né? principalmente para a gente, né? que somos pesquisadores de estudos de linguagem, é, é algo extremamente interessante. E, e vamos lá. Então, vamos ouvir o Nick a partir de agora. Nick, uh, it's, it's with you. I, I would like, any, uh, I would like uh, to thank you very much in the name of the group. Uh, for your your time, for 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 your for for the fact that you are here with us today, so it's with you now. Thanks, Renata. Thank you all so much for having me um, and being patient with the fact that I'm speaking only English. Sorry for that, but um, but I really appreciate the opportunity to share the work, and um, hopefully our tech will work well enough that everything comes through. So I'm gonna share screen and if it if there's any issues yell at me because um it looks like the way the controls are i can't see you while i'm doing it uh, so let's try let me just try and no that would be a disaster okay i'll do that so far so good not yet ah, now it's coming it takes a second all right and then I'm going to go from the beginning. Okay, you can see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, hi. Uh, I'm Nick. Um, again, thanks for having me. And I, I am now an associate professor uh, running a comic studies program at San Francisco State. I'm a comics maker. And as you all know, I did my dissertation in comics, which um, has had a good life as Unflattening and a couple other titles, um, as you know. So I'll, I'm going to take you through a little bit of how I came to do this, uh, and and I'm going to end when we get to the end. Uh, in the middle, I'll talk about some things I think about how comics work, but in the end, I'll talk about my process uh, a little bit more in detail. Um, so I did my dissertation as a comic, and it's important to say that I didn't just show up at the university and say, "Ooh, comics would be cool." Um, I was a comics maker as a kid. Uh, Batman was my first work. I had a much older brother who re read comics to me. Um, both of my children have now done the same with uh, picking up Batman. I made my, my own superhero from junior high into high school. Um, and he makes a cameo appearance in, in Unflattening. Um, 
but as much as I was into comics as a reader and a maker, uh, when I came to university, uh, comics is not a thing you could do. Uh, it's not a no option to do it. And even if there was, it would have been sort of th as through illustration. And I, I really wanted to do intellectual things. And uh, uh, comics, I, I didn't, you know, I thought about that as this entertainment thing. Um, so uh, what's interesting to me in, in retrospect is that uh, when I, so I studied mathematics, that's the thing I chose to study in university and I loved it. Um, so when you tell somebody you study mathematics, at least here, uh, they say, oh, you're so smart. And if you're known for making art as I am now, they say, oh, you're so talented. And, and the truth of the matter is, I think I was a really talented mathematician. I was very clever at figuring things out. How smart I was or not, it's harder to say. But I think as an art maker, there are people who can draw far more talented than I can. Um, but I think my art making has made me smarter than I could be without it. So I think a goal, oh, I think, am I good? Yeah, it is. Okay. I think a goal of my work is to sort of heal that rift between smart and talented, both in my, my work and my teaching. And I, I think some of the goals of what we're up to. So like I said, there's this gap in my comics making. Um, and I ran an arts magazine in Detroit in the early 2000s and was asked to be in a political art show around the 2004 US presidential election. And I only had a couple days to make something. So I made a comic. Um, and this this is the first one I made. Uh, and it's very Scott McCloud like there's me and my T-shirt explaining things um, in the ways that Scott did so well and had such a huge impact on me. There was a subsequent show uh, right after the 2004 US presidential election. And I really wanted to as much as I love McCloud's work, I wanted to do something very different. Um, I, I, you know, he did his thing well, but that didn't mean I should do things like it. Um, and I was quite moved by, uh, this is Alan Moore and Melinda Gebby's comic. Uh, this is information from a 9-11 anthology comic released in 2002. And it's, it's a visual essay, rather than being a story, rather than having a narrator and characters, it's, it's an essay using uh, symbols, using metaphorical language, and really playing around between the images and language. And, and that that struck a chord with me. Uh, and so the, the, the follow-up piece, so this is two weeks after the first one, um, is a piece about voting where I quite literally smash my narrator, my visible narrator. And instead it becomes this whole metaphor about voting or a show of hands. So every single panel became something to do with hands. And that that play of, of symbols and metaphorical imagery really shaped my work going forward. Uh, I would later do, uh, we'd put on an exhibition of games and art, and I, uh, I did the essay as a comic book for it. Um, and this is a page about why games aren't just for kids using uh, fictional rabbits. Uh, the whole, there's a lot I could say about this, but I'll, I'll keep moving on. And it's with those pieces, well, I guess I did some others. I, I continue to do some political ones every four years. Um, this one is about how silly my country is about separating people by color, red and blue. Um, I guess I've continued some more. These are more recent. Um, anyway, when I came to Columbia or when I applied to Columbia, I said, these are the kinds of things I can do, this games comic and some of the political one. Uh, and they admitted me on that. Um, so as soon as I became a student there, I was making comics for my work. I was fortunate to have a uh, legendary professor, Maxine Green, a professor of a philosopher of aesthetic education. Um, uh, she was 90 when I first had her and she was 96 at my defense and passed a few weeks after that. Um, so this is the first semester. I made a comic about her, not as the sort of old woman that she looked like, but as the the spinning dynamo of energy that she was. Um, and it's maybe risky to make a comic about your professor, but uh, we became fast friends after that. So I think it was the right call. Um, sometime later, uh, my advisor in English education, uh, Professor Ruth Vins, asked me to do the last chapter of her book on narrative research, so using stories as research, and she said, do what you want. So I made a comic that is either about drawing 
or it's about how we see, or it's about doing research. And I had stripped out all the language. The, the things I had learned in my political comics was to, was to take out divisive language, things that could say, I'm in this party or this. And I continued that in my academic work by stripping out disciplinary, discipline-specific words, field-specific, a lot of jargon. I tried to pull out all that stuff and, and use metaphor instead. So somebody might think the work is about this and somebody else might think the work is about that, but they're all sort of coming at it through their own direction. Um, so before I get to unflattening, well, I guess, so, so this is really my, my formal decisions is that I would not illustrate, I would not be a character saying, hey, this happened, then this happened. Um, I would, I shifted to, to metaphor and really my images and words in my process, as we'll see near the end, suggest each other. Uh, since then, I've done a few short things. I did a comic on climate change for the 2015 Paris talks um, for nature which you can, all of these things you can find. I did a short comic on Columbia University's first comics librarian who was there when I was there. Um, which, and, and then more recently, and this could be a different topic we talk about sometime, but I got accidentally involved at my university or in a project on making comics or exploring how to make comics accessible for blind and low vision readers. And we've hold, held a bunch of events and this spring, I made a very short comic for a magazine uh, about how difficult the challenge of making comics for blind readers is. Um, that also includes an audio comic for to make sense of, you know, for, for the for the non visual reader. So um, so those are some more recent things. But we'll go back to unflattening. So like I said, uh, you know, I sort of had this way of working. Um, the school admitted me based on the comics work that I was doing. And um, and I dove into it. So uh, some of you have read it. Uh, some of you haven't. I'll, I'll take you on a, a sort of fast tour of it. Oh, here it is in Brazil. Um, I wasn't there for this. I haven't seen that cute trophy, but it's pretty neat, I think. Um, uh, so so unflattening to, to talk about unflattening, it's, it's helpful to say what this nightmare of flatness is. And I, I, it was not a literal thing. It was a, a flattening of possibilities. A place where while it seems there's lots of choices the choices are already made for us so we forget what might be and are sort of trapped in how it is um because i had this word unflattening in my it was already floating around from how i was thinking about how comics worked um i i thought of uh, edwin abbott's uh, 1880s novella flat land um, which i was familiar with uh, for my mathematics work um, and I thought that was a good metaphor to help explain what I meant. So Flatland, for those of you who don't know, is the story of the geometric inhabitants, so squares, circles, triangles, lines, etc., uh, of an infinite two-dimensional plane. So there, these, these, these creatures are capable of moving east and west and southwards and northwards, but they have no concept of upwards. They can't conceive of anything that's off their plane of existence. And to a non-flatlander like ourselves, yeah, you know, we look down on that and say, well, that's ridiculous. But, uh, but what I wanted to ask is, what are the things we can't think about because they're outside of our perception? What, 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 what are we missing? Um, so this very much becomes a, a, a story about interdisciplinarity, about art and mathematics, about art and text. Um, but, but because I'm in the context of school, I'm in a, a teacher's college, a school of education, I'm very much pushing against uh, the institution of education as a form of flattening, as a series of steps, a recipe of, you know, things are done to us rather than explored. And I, I think a lot, at least in this country, uh, that, our, that our learning has been put into boxes and it's boxes of time, it's boxes of literal space, the classroom, and it's boxes of subject. So if you're somebody like myself who studied art and studied mathematics, those are things that are usually kept separate. And we see it as kind of odd when somebody likes both. And then if you know, in my case, I, I made my living as a, as a tennis pro for all the way through the end of my doctoral program. You know, you think athletics and art and science, they're not, you know, those are usually separate people. But, but I really felt and feel that these are, the, these borders that we draw between ourselves, uh, 
within ourselves are, are fake, that the borders are fake, and we've, we've accepted them as reality. So I wanted to push back, back against that way of lining up things. And specifically, because here I am doing a doctorate, um, I wanted to push back against the 12 point type double spaced one by one by one by one and a half, half inch margins. Not because those aren't good, not because there's necessarily anything wrong with them at all, but why to say, is that the only way we can present meaning? Why can't we present it in other ways? Um, and so, you know, what, what, what don't we see? What do we fail to see when we're only accepting one channel as the way information is exchanged? And what might we make visible when we see in other ways? Um, so I have this page about my dog, which was a bit of an apology. It was to say, look, I'm talking about uh, ways of knowing, but I'm using ways of seeing as my metaphor. And so I introduced the dog to sort of explain that. Um, but it's, it's become one of my favorite pages. Um, and I think, uh, so we all know the dog's sense of smell is stronger than yours and mine. But, but what's really true is, is that it's more nuanced, which means if we were in the same room and I was speaking at a, a podium or lectern, um, I could see the color and the angles of it and all those things. But I, the dog would know who had spoken there earlier in the day. The dog would be aware of who'd spoken there the day before, the day before that, and maybe a whole week before in ways that I would have no idea unless somebody gave me a list of names. Um, so the dog has access to, to layers of time that I, I simply can't through its sense of smell. And I think that's a kind of upwards, the kinds of way of, of seeing that we just, you know, we all do different things. It's not to say we should have smell of vision books but it's to say, how do we bring those other ways of seeing into the ways we make learning? So again, this, this is very much in a technical way, uh, an argument for interdisciplinarity. Um, and, and in a, the simplest way, unflattening, you know, this is not the same as this. And when we come from both, we don't bump into things as much. We can catch a ball easier. We can navigate the world and build up a, a three-dimensional map of it in ways that are harder to do with only one. Um, and we don't have to stop at one. We can bring in many ways. So for me, uh, this working in comics was both a way to do this thing that I had loved, um, you know, that I had loved and sort of let go for a while, um, but also a, a way to be amphibious, to breathe in the worlds of both image and text, and and maybe start to step out, see some of my own flatness in my thinking, and find different ways to make meaning. Um, so that's like the fast version of what I'm up to in it. For those of you who don't know, um, I want to shift here now to talk about comics, um, which I assume many of you are very well versed in. And some of you, maybe this is somewhat newer. And um, so hopefully this will work for all of you. Um, before we say what they are, what I think they are, uh, you know, we're in this fascinating time that here, here we are uh, a continent apart talking about comics. Like that's not something... 20 years ago, 30 years ago, conversations like this wouldn't exist, right? Like we, we wouldn't have a bunch of academics uh, talking about comics. Um, you certainly wouldn't be studying them. So, and, and, and comics are not just geek culture. They're all of culture for right now. Um, so, you know, it's an exciting time, but yet comics aren't that new. You know, the, the Marvel age of comics is 60, it's over 60 years old now. Um, these guys, are, this is 80 years ago, like th these things have been around. This is not new. The first comic book is coming out in 1934 in the United States. It's an old thing. Um, in, in the U.S., we point to Richard Outcult's The Yellow Kid as the sort of birth of comics in a, the industrial sense that we know them. And that, that predates film. So again, comics aren't so new. Um, but if we look farther back, Rudolf Topfer, the Swiss artist comics, uh, these are essentially comics that maybe oh, different dog. Um, hold on one second. Okay. Um, so this work is even older. But then if we look farther back from illuminated manuscripts and bio tapestry and codices and Trajan's column and, and Egyptian murals, there are things that are comics like that go way, way back and all the way back to things that are as old as 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 we've been human. 
And I, I don't want to say that any of those things are necessarily comics as we know them, but I do think it's really important to say humans have been making sense of their world through images, through picture stories, as long as we've been human. And I, I think it's really a recent phenomenon that we push that aside in favor of text only. Um, and I think in my case, if I added anything to this, I, I think the last 150 years, there've been so many arguments for why visual thinking matters, why it's important to use images, et cetera. But at the end of the day, all of those have been written. We've been doing a lot of writing about it and we haven't necessarily been doing a lot of image making about it. So that's just to say that, you know, it's an exciting time for comics. Uh, it's an exciting time that we can study them, that we embrace them more in our classrooms, embrace them more as makers. But it's not new. This has been this is part and parcel of being human. So, OK, we'll shift to say a little bit about how I think comics work, which uh, each maker and each theorist, I think, has their own version of that. Um, but this definitely shapes how I am as a maker, which, again, is what we're headed towards. So I, I like to, when I talk about this, my students, I like to start with McLeod's definition. I think it really helps them get a sense of it. Um, you know, his juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence. Here's my fist with a nice box around it. Here's my fist with another box around it. Two static images, they together, they take on meaning. They take on an action of my punch. Um, it's, a, it's a gestalt thing where we're, we're drawing an inference. And the reader is responsible for animating it, for bringing it to life, because again, it is a static thing. And I think one of the most important things here is that the passage of time has to be written in space. So in here, I've, I've redrawn a Paleolithic lunar calendar. So like 30,000 years ago, people are trying to figure out why is the moon, why is this thing in the sky changing every day? What, what is that about? And how do they make sense of it? Well, they, they make notations on a, a surface and they make it each day and they can, you know, they start to see patterns. They start to see a story develop. Um, and I think that observations of events in time and, and noting them in space is like fundamentally human. And again, I, I won't say that this is a comic, right? I won't say that it's that, but that kind of thinking is really fundamental to who we are. And there's, I, I don't know how much I want to dwell on any of this, but comics play a lot with time. And it's a very strange thing to think about this flat medium that doesn't do anything as one of the most interesting mediums to deal with time. But yet I think, I think it really does. And McLeod talks about this, you know, the space between a panel can be a snap or it can be a million years. Um, I share this with my students all the time, you know, which takes longer the space here because we have repetition some, and I have them vote and some of them say, well, that takes longer. And then when they stretch the panel, does that take longer? And some of them vote for that the space, this gap between the panel, some of them vote for that. This absence of a panel, some of them vote for that. So the, the fact is, if we think about the, the space in comics, the space of a panel as like a moment in time, it, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. And it's not as simple as comparing comics to storyboards, where a storyboard is like part of a time-based medium. A comics panel is part of a space-based, me spatially oriented medium. So how the panels shape and how they're oriented and how they're drawn is part of the meaning. Uh, and that makes comics really weird, as I hope to show more. So just a few examples of comics that deal with time. It's, this one's so simple, but I really like it because, you know, we, we see the repetition of her. Uh, the green dress and the red hair allows us to know what's happening. And then at the end, she says, well, that sucked. Um, and there's lots of there's lots of implications of this. this. Is a flash comic where he's multiple images of him in the same space. Uh, the Deluca effect uh, from Gianni Deluca. Um, this is from Hamlet, I think. Um, multiple images in the same space. A Daredevil comic doing the same thing. Um, and I I think about this thinking about the Cubists and their attempts to sort of deal with the fourth dimension. Um, is Marcel Duchamp's new descending a staircase. I, I find some of the same things uh, that we see in Spider-Man, you know, any, any uh, comic off the shelf might try this kind of trick. Um, the comics are really good at handling this, this 
compression of time into a single space um, in ways that I think were really hard to do in what the Cubists tried to do. Um, so the second thing I want to address is, is really the heart of my own theorizing on comics is, uh, so, so sure, we read a comics page sequentially. We read left to right, top to bottom. We tend to do that. Um, but because it's a visual thing, we can't help but take in the whole thing at once and start to make connections from the lower right up to the upper left. And in fact, in multiple directions across the page. And maybe even, this is a question I ask my students all the time, you know, what do you, what do you read first, the words or the pictures? And, and some people say words, some say pictures, and, and many suggest a third strategy or more where they take in the whole page, they figure out how to read it, and then they start attacking the individual elements. And so you might in my page read, be reading and say, rather associations that stretch web-like, and then you're like, oh, look, he drew the spider web right here. Um, that's probably not a coincidence. And so there's a back and forth between image and text too. So, so reading, you know, reading is no longer, it's not just that we've added pictures and words together. It's that reading stops being this neatly linear thing and starts becoming multi-directional and back and forth. So comics sure proceed sequentially in a sort of hierarchical thing like a tree, but they're also in the, the fancy word for it, rhizomatic with many roots all interconnected. They're also this interwoven network. Um, and that has a lot of implications. Uh, I really, I, th this panel from Watchmen has always stayed with me. And I think, um, I think it really speaks to how comics, this, this interconnected nature allows comics to handle time in a really interesting way. So for those of you who don't know, Dr. Manhattan is this time displaced character. And in many ways, he is a stand in for the reader. Um, he's, he's aware of how we're looking at the page. And so he says here, there is no future. There is no past. Do you see? So in, in one sense, sure, this page goes, read, 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 read. But this panel and this panel take place 30 years earlier than the rest of the page. So when he says there is no future, there is no past, do you see it? Well, they're all happening on the comics page at the same time. And if you're looking from the, from the space that we, the reader, are looking, there is no future and there's no past. They're all there at once. Um, I think McLeod is, is quite aware of this. It's not quite part of his theory, theorizing. Both past and future are real and visible and all around us. Um, these two things, I think, reference each other. But ultimately, I think what this allows comics uh, is, is it, it, it mirrors a little bit of how our brains work. So, uh, you know, we, we've kind of gotten rid of the old left brain, right brain, uh, art and language thing. Um, uh, but but I think it's come back with a sort of linear awareness and an all over awareness, which means we go through our day linearly. We move through time. You know, you're you went to lunch. You're coming to this talk. You're going to do something after you are marching through time linearly. But your thoughts, something I say says, oh, that makes me think of this. Or you're remembering something before or you're anticipating something coming later. So while you're marching linear th linearly through time your thoughts are moving all at once in this simultaneous experience. And I think comics let us do both of those things at the same time to really great effect. Um, so I, I find the static and flat, flat nature of comics as a superpower. That means we care both about the individual drawings on the page, but also the whole, the whole drawing that is the page. And that allows all these really interesting possibilities. Uh, this is from Mark Antoine Matu's comic about the Louvre. And if you're familiar with the Louvre, there's a pyramid out front, it's significant. Um, if I were to show you this comic as nine separate panels, you wouldn't see the pyramid that runs through the whole page. So it's sequential, but it also relies on this simultaneous whole page image. Uh, Gasoline Alley from the 1930s, the character bumbles sequentially, sequentially through the page but it's a single page. It's a single simultaneous whole where he's the only one or he and the kid are the only ones moving through it. Um, and it's additionally weirder than that because he moves left to right. And then he moves again left to right. But he doesn't come back here. It's just we're used to reading left to right, left to right, left to right. So we accept it. 
it makes sense. Even though if you start thinking about what's going on there, it doesn't really make sense. But it's comics, and comics are pretty weird and pretty cool for how weird they are. In uh, David Mazzuchelli's Asterius Polyp, he, direct, he addresses this directly. Uh, the character says, simultaneity, the, the awareness of so much happening at once, is now the most salient aspect of contemporary life. And here we see sequence, one, two, and then everything sort of collapses in this all at once simultaneous image. Um, Matthew Shelley plays with this a lot. This is very much like the Gasoline Alley page. Our character moves through what's a single scene, but it's taking place in different times. His jacket's changing, his pants are changing. It's, it's clearly not the same moment. Um, and this one, I'm going to let you, if somebody will laugh out loud when you get the joke, uh, I'll continue after that. <laughs> Uh, all right, I'm going to assume somebody left. No, we did. We did. Oh, good. Everybody's here. Everybody's laughing. Good. <laughs> um, so our little guy, he wants to get the fruit, but he can't get the fruit um, in the normal way, but he can get it because he lives in comic book land where space and time are kind of the same thing. So he can march back against the page. And it is a, it is a thing you can't really imagine doing in another form. So that whole sort of simple idea of the panel break, which you know, from Captain America way back, it could just be for action, right? It could just be, let's show dynamic action or bizarre action. I, I still can't get over this page where Batman jumps off this diving board and then into another panel in 1956, right? This is not avant-garde comic book making. This is just your monthly superhero one, but it's pretty crazy. Um, Windsor McKay allowing the character to interact with himself because he's stepping out of the panel. You can do it very purposely. Windsor McKay, again, the panel becoming a character, essentially part of the story. Um, so part of this, this is something I really stress with students, is that you know, we, we often equate comics with, with storyboards for movies. And, and in some ways, that's true, right? We care about what's in the panel or what's in the frame. But, but in comics, the panel has so much more meaning. We care about the size of it, as we've seen, the shape of it, uh, its orientation, its, its placement on the page, and what it's next to and what it's not next to, and in fact, what it's made of, <laughs> so they can play with it. Uh, this from Frank Quitely's drawings for WE3, the, the weaponized cat moves sequentially through a simultaneous scene. In this Young Avengers comic, um, the panel is marking time the way we're used to panels doing it, but it is also acting as another dimension that has trapped this character and that they escape, ultimately escape from. Not something that really makes sense in storyboard world, unless you then shrink this, you know, it, it's not something that works in that way. In Nina, Nina Paley's cartoon here, the panel becomes, uh, the panel becomes a psychological dimension for her that engulfs her. Um, and then from Understanding Comics, Matt Fiesel's Mr. Spot, who's stealing from himself in the future. These are, these are things that really only make sense in the world of comics. And I'm, I, I'm assuming a few of you are familiar with uh, Mr. Invincible. It's got different names in different countries. It's a French comic. But what's, what's, if you teach comics, I, I highly recommend this. It's just such a treat. But this is a character whose superpower is that he's not in a fourth wall breaking way, but in a... I don't know how to describe it, but he's aware he's in a comic because he can see the other panels. While So he sees bad things about to happen and he sees that he's going to deal with them and then he deals with them after the fact. Um, I think this is the simplest one. So he's supposed to rescue this cat and he's like, instead of climbing the tree, he reaches to the panel below him to get it and then he's rescued her. Um, and for a second there, there's two cats at once, but then everything gets back to normal. It's, it's really just a nice showcase of how weird comics are. And, and one other property of this that I think is, is interesting and it's something I played with is uh, I, I heard the comic scholar Kent Worster uh, describe it as flippability, but it's the idea that we remember what we've seen from, from one page and if it's repeated in some way on another page, we'll make connections across the book. So not just connections across the page in the way I was talking about, but connections across the entire book. Uh, this is Asterius Polyp again. 
uh, we see the, man, the main character's living room in this square panel from this angle. And we see it five other times at different stages exactly from that same position. Um, and that, you know, they're 20, 30, 50 pages apart from each other, but it allows us to draw this connection and we can flip, flip ability. We can flip and see it and see it, but, but it, it stitches the book together in an interesting way. Watchmen does this quite notably with the smiley face and the blood on it. It, you know, I, I didn't even try to get about, you know, there's, there's probably hundreds of examples of this in the book. Um, I did this myself in unflattening. Uh, I had, I, I was showing how Eratosthene figured out the circumference of the earth. I noticed that this, this way I had drawn it felt a little bit like an eye that was open. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And I came up with this symbol. And then I started seeding the book with the symbol throughout. Um, so it shows sometimes it was an accident, sometimes uh, this door opening. So as I, it, it's a thing that I never talk about. And it's a, the, the blood splatter you don't talk about. It's not something that's in the text. It's not something that's addressed. It's just something that's there. And you notice it through your visual or you don't. But I think over time, you start to build up those connections across the book and say, oh, this has meaning. And I think the ability of comics to do things that go unsaid is another strength, right? They can, there's things that happen in the pictures that connect to other pictures that never need to be part of the main narrative, but yet create a whole other conversation. Um, I was going to talk about Richard McGuire's here, but I'm going to leave it because I don't have a, it didn't fit into any place I wanted to. Um, so, so the second formal decision of mine, and, and now we're going to get to the process, is is how to embody ideas in the shape of the page how can i think about the way the reader moves through the composition and in this is this example here this was uh this was in the chapter on ruts so i was contrasting uh, a typical commuter who goes out and back out and back with my wife who who did different things each day different different routes different places um and so in a sort of illustrational way the way i came back to this i might have said well here's the typical one and here's my wife's and, and and that would work right you would get it but i wanted to see what can i do with the very way the page works so in this case in the background in the the 16 grid on the background um i have encoded the out and back out and back so that repeats 16 times it's the same thing it gets darker as it goes um but that's in the background going like this and then on the foreground i have mapped her locations differently for each one onto a map of manhattan and I've let them sort of float across the page the way that a leaf might drift and, and in the way that she moved through the city. So in one way, it's kind of readable in a neat, you know, it's fairly linear, but the way all the elements come together is very not flat, right? It's not flat at all. And there's a lot of density of information, despite the fact that it's, it, it's fairly straightforward. Um, I've continued this. This was a comic uh, for the Boston Globe about entropy. Um, and it's about the things that go against. If entropy is a downhill flow, this is the, the things that go against it. So you know, your coffee gets cold, your laundry won't pick itself up. Um, but I wanted the page itself to do that. So, so, so this one, it's linear, it's linear, it's linear, and it still is. It's, going to, it's asking you to read here. And then all of a sudden, the reading moves right to left. And then the reading moves bottom to top before kicking you out and starting to move in the direction you're used to again. So again, it's not just about adding pictures to words. It's not just about the image strength, but it's about how reading itself becomes, uh, becomes a transformative thing, becomes very different than what we're accustomed to. Um, these are just a couple, I, this took me about 50 pages in my notebook to figure out what I wanted to do. I finally figured it out here. Um, and so I, I really like uh, the cartoonist Seth, who, who argues against comics as prose and illustration and says comics are really poetry and graphic design. And I think thinking about my students who often come to me as non-drawers, um, that's really rings true for them is that they find their way into it by thinking about how the space works, how the page works. And I'm going to when I finally get to the end, I'll close with that. Um, so I think a lot about composition. My, my wife noticed as I was drawing on flattening that I had never, you know, she's like, well, I haven't seen a page like that before. And she walked by again and she said, I haven't seen a page like that before. So I made a, a vow not to make any page that, that looked the same. 
um, except for once where I repeat the composition intentionally. Um, and I made the composition first before I drew the content, before I figured out the content. Um, so here is the here is the page as it's the first time it appears, this character going about his morning, going to work, then he's at his job, this sort of routine of the job, and then the, the reverse. Um, so we see it once, and then we see it a second time, and here he's discovered something new, this little egg, and it's given him a bit of a thought. And then this thing has grown, and it's either this very hungry caterpillar eating through the page, or it's his thoughts expanding as it's changing. And then we see it one last time and the page falls apart. But because the page, we've seen it repeated, we understand we, we, it, makes, it means something when the page actually de, uh, d disintegrates in this instance. If I'd done that right off the bat, it, it wouldn't, make, wouldn't have any meaning. It would just be a page that it looked like this. Um, so I really like to play with how you move through the page. So this one is a reference to uh, James Joyce's Ulysses and the page specifically about uh, it, it, the question on the page is, did it flow? And it's about how water came to the tap and all the, all the places the water came from. So I wanted the page to move in the ways that, that rivers move or that the pipes would take the water. So it, it, you know, it, it does these things by drawing style. It does by things by um, where I've put the text, text captions. Um, there's a lot of cues that help us know how to read this. This theme goes this way. Um, this river flows into this. This anchors us here to make you go through that experience. Um, this one, which I'm going to say more about in a minute, but Scheherazade's page moves like I thought her name felt. Um, this one about coming from multiple perspectives, you know, the, the page itself has no center. Um, this was interesting because I my initial attempt, I'm, I, I'm talking about things getting lighter, um, but because we tend to read left to right, I was like, well, that didn't quite work. Um, and it has a pun in it. It has a pun which did not, I think in the Portuguese translation is correct, but in most of them it is not. Um, it's a pun about uh, getting lighter, which in English, lightning, there's, there's lightning that, you know, electricity from the clouds and there's light tinning, which is getting lighter. And, and um, I'm making this pun here, but I wanted the page to to feel like it's getting lighter. So I, the ultimate decision was to run the page upward, even though the text still went downward. It's probably better solutions I could think of now, but that's what happened then. Um, this has become an activity for my classes. I, I made it called Zithers, where I, I make a path and then I have them try to figure out how they can organize a page to, to move in those directions, um, which is fun, whole other subject. Um, so, in, with Chris Ware's work, I think is is useful here in thinking about how well. Yes, he has linear sequential stories. He also has, you know, he's so known for these tangents, these things that go off to the side, the frozen moments of memory. So, I think comics are a profoundly powerful way to represent our thinking. But the flip side of all of that is they're a profoundly powerful way to generate our thinking, and and that takes me to process. So, as somebody who works alone. Um, I don't really work alone because I, I have my drawings. And when you make marks, you start to see things in your marks that you don't anticipate. I love to share this. This is in the back of the book, um, the first sketch map, partly because uh, you know it's fun to see the Easter eggs of what I did and what I didn't do. But, but it also shows how badly I sketch, which I think should encourage other people who maybe don't think they can to say, I can draw that badly too. Um, and also that this is not a picture of my thinking, this is it. Like without these sketches and iterating them over time, it's a very different thing. This is not a book I wrote and added pictures to. This is a book that evolved through the drawings and it took me places. Um, people ask, do you come up with the words first or the pictures first? And I say, yes. And by using doing both of them at once, it starts to take me in new directions and, and and also makes me do new research as I'm trying to figure out the drawings, which I'll say a little bit about later. Um, I am very, uh, very moved by, by working with constraints, by making a sort of game of it. Uh, as the author Bernard Suits in a book called The Grasshopper wrote, playing a game is a voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. 
Uh, Raymond Cano on the Olympians, he wrote Rats Who Build the Labyrinth from Which They Will Try to Escape. And in my new work, I sort of took these things together. We construct our own ever more ingenious obstacles, traps from which we must devise new pathways by which to escape. Um, I'm quite a fan of Matt Madden's 99 Ways to Tell a Story, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and I use this with my students all the time. I'm going to jump over that. Sorry, Christian. Um, so I'll just say a little bit about how this works. This is the page about comics having a lousy name, um, and uh, which is in unflattening, and at least in English, comics have a lousy name. And I started with Shakespeare's uh, phrase, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And I paraphrased it and put in comics. And then I'm like, all right, every panel I'm going to do here is going to have something to do with the rose, like my show of hands and the rabbits uh, many years earlier. Um, how can I, that's my constraint, right? Um, so I play a lot. I play, I make all these sketches and I, they start to become symbols and meaning. And I keep playing and eventually it takes shape. And I find, and I don't know if words came first or pictures in any particular one, I have no idea anymore, but this is a juncture. This is a place where I turn from sort of the philosophical to something more concrete. So the, the branching there served as that. Um, we're looking deep into the rose petals. We tend to intricacies. This is an X-ray image of a, of a rose, the inner workings. And I continued with that. Um, continued to play with how the image was affecting the words and the words were affecting the image and all of them have something to do with a rose um again this this is also something i've turned into assignment for students um so two more full pages to go through the process and then near the end um this is the page about multimodality so the idea that that coming through you know rather than just text communicating ideas that that we learn through image and action and color and gesture and all kinds of other things um so it's important to say that i don't work in color typically this book's not in color um which had i worked in color this would be a very different page and and again the constraints i set up for myself at the beginning is i don't have characters and i don't have a story and i try my best not to tell you what i'm actually talking about so those are sort of the rules i've built for myself so at the start, I always have to figure out what's the page going to, you know, what's the metaphor? What am I going to do here? Um, so my initial attempt at multimodality was an omelet, which may not have the same meaning there. Um, but anyway, eggs with a bunch of different things cut up and mixed into them. Um, but the omelet felt good, like it has, you can taste the different flavors, but they all kind of make one thing. And, and I like that, but it didn't quite feel good enough. My next attempt was was a keyboard, like each key you press gives you a different different kind of signal. I was like, well, that has some potential. But on that same page, I drew, oh, the orchestra, right? The symphony. So the different instruments play. If you listen, you can hear them separately, but they all come together as one. I'm like, all right, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. But as I drew it on the same page, I'm like, well, the conductor is kind of where the space bar is on a keyboard. And, and early typewriters were actually curved. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool, Type, typewriter symphony thing. So I, I, I'm excited. I got this idea from my drawing. And the next thing is like, all right, you've got all these things going on in your head, but they come out through one channel. So I keep drawing this idea. And as I draw it, I draw it simpler each time because I, I, I've already drawn it once. I don't need to think about it a lot. And when I did it this time, I noticed how much it looked like this symphony I'd drawn. I was like, ooh, all right. I'll put a symphony in the head. That will make a lot of sense. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm close. But right here, I want to have a little setup, like an opening paragraph that says, this is what multimodality is. And then I'm going to get into the discussion here. But I have a problem because I'm working in comics. And the problem is that you move, you move, you move, and you move down. But I need something to have you go back up. And it was really a struggle to figure out what that something would be. Um, I kind of at some point gave up and said, all right, I'm just going to draw an arrow, which I do not want to draw. But in drawing my arrow as badly as I drew it, I noticed how much the arrow looked like my could look like my thumb. And then I was like, aha, I understand what to do. So there's my hand on the keyboard, which I have a keyboard already. I figured it out mostly, and, and I can show you how this works. Um, there's the thought balloons here, which are 
are both clouds and thought balloons. They stay over here. There's a good gap here that goes, the dots go into the head. This thermometer that becomes this, this person's head goes into the box. So there's a lot of things to say, stay over here. Uh, the boxes, the captions overlap, which also keep holding you in here. And you finally get down to here, and this box is weird in that it flows directly into the curve of the hand and says, let's go back up here before we, a little more straightforward, come back down. Um, so it's, I, the, the key in this is to say, I didn't really know what I was doing, um, but I kept playing with the drawings and the rules I had set up, and it led me to a page that, that was definitely not in my, my head at the beginning. It only came about because of following those constraints. Uh, the other one here is that Scheherazade page. I knew very early on that I, just because I, I, I like the idea of the nested stories in the Arabian Nights tales, um, that I wanted to do something with it. It fits, it fits how I work. Um, and so I, I knew that I would have like a zoom in and a, or a zoom out, either literally or metaphorically, each panel. And it would move a little bit like her name. Um, but in the middle of the page, uh, you know, this is about the transformative power of stories. Um, I wanted to say by stories, I don't simply mean the fabulous or fantastical, but I also mean things like science. So if I was writing, I would have said things like science and put a period there. If I was illustrating, I would have said things like science, put a period and a picture of Einstein. But here, I'm like, I have to have something that fits in my visual schema. I have to have something that has a reason to exist here. Um, and so I spent a ton of time researching and figuring out well, what was going on in science when the Arabian Nights tales were written down and where they were written down. And I ended up stumbling on the work uh, by a, a Persian astronomer working in the Arab empire in the 1300s by the name of Al-Tusi, whose work was picked up by Copernicus 300 years later. Um, I already had this page about Copernicus, so this was perfect. Um, so I play a lot with how to make it work, continue to play a lot with how to make it work, um, and, and all of that, all of that research becomes this little corner of the page, which I'll show closer. Um, so my point in this is to say there's nothing in my notes, nothing in my outline that says you should, you should, ref, you should research uh, an obscure bit of Arab astronomy from the 1300s. The only thing that sent me there was my drawings. And my drawing said, you need to figure this out. And I had to just follow through until I found something that made the drawings work. Um, and that's something that's something I, you know, I, I started this work to make uh, big ideas accessible. But I think what I really learned is is that drawing from the start changes how you do your thinking. And I see this in my students who come to this again, very, very less uh, as drawers. So so I really think comics making is a different make way of thinking. Um, I think a lot about movement now. I had somebody do a dance to my work, which really tied into my own thinking. Um, and I think about the idea of choreography. My goal on the page is it's very slow motion choreography, but how do I want to make you experience something? How do I want to make you move through the page to feel the idea? Um, in choreography, uh, we're, we're immersed in rhythms from before we're born. This is from the new work. Um, I'll jump past that. Um, so, so just a few words about the new work and we'll be done. Um, the, the sequel, if, if such a book has a sequel to Unflattening, I, I, I'm thinking a lot about the role of movement on our, uh, as a kind of thinking. I think about this in my classes. I think about it in my own work. Um, this is a page from it. You know, do ideas come out fully formed or are there things that happen when we're running, when we're in the shower, when we're making marks? Um, when we're moving, I, I'm gonna leave that out too. So to me, it's, it's incredibly important to continue to, to work big, to see that, to you, let my visual system see connections, often to draw badly, because in drawing badly, I see things I did not expect in my sketches. I make connections, you know, I make a drawing, I'm like, oh, that looks more like that than I realized. And, and it sends me in new directions. Um, so this is just a little bit of a tease. This is what I'm working on. There's a 15 foot long opening chapter that is both read as a book, but also can be a scroll or a, a accordion book. Um, this is a page from it or a spread from it. Someday I'll be done. 
couple other pages and I'm playing with constraints. I have an entire chapter that's all circular compositions. Took me a long time to figure out. Um, and I, I wanna end with saying just a few words about my students, um, cause now I run a comics program and all kinds of comics classes. I draw my syllabi. Um, it's important to me to sort of, uh, to, to show, it, pre, to, <laughs> to, to, dem to demonstrate the stuff I want them to do. Um, it's important to me that classes are a combination of study and play. And I teach them things like sketch notes. So they take notes as visual note taking, which some of them really take to. Uh, we do analysis, visual analysis. We annotate right directly on pages, which makes them moving your hand makes you think different. And we make tons of comics, which I'm not going to show you except, except two. Oh, here we go. All right, so this is the last two things. So as I said, I, I, that idea of, of comics being a, a graphic design and poetry um, and less about illustration and, and, and you know, less about illustration, you know, can you draw a good nose or not? Um, it's, I think that'll keep people out. But this student definitely couldn't draw a good nose, wasn't interested in it, didn't even bother drawing noses, in fact. But this comic about his grandmother uh, with Alzheimer's really is one of my standout pieces. And I'm just going to show you these three panels of which he didn't draw anything. I didn't know my grandma. I was told about her. He leaves it blank. This person no longer existed. He leaves it blank. And then she was nobody. And he leaves it blank. And he put them all in this thing. I mean, he thought so much about the page, not because he was a tremendous drawer, but because he's thinking about how the page works. And then the final one, which I have shared every time I've spoken since she made it for a class of mine many years ago, non-drawer, very shy student, um, but one of the most profound pieces I've seen. Uh, these very negative words, and it says sometimes she could feel the weight of the words on her shoulders. And here is very positive words emanating like from a son, but she is strong. This is a story about a girl who couldn't fit in a box. And she played with the panels in sort of panel breaking way that I, I went over very quickly. And they laugh from their boxes that fit as she contorted and twisted, unable to find a place. So she makes her own box out of words, sounds, and pictures. And soon she learns that there is no need for borders, that boxes restrict her unnecessarily since she can go anywhere she wishes. In her case, again, she didn't become like a master illustrator, but she, she used the form to make thoughts that she couldn't do without it, to understand herself in ways she couldn't do without it and to use to, to play, to play with how we read. Um, and I see that in all my students, that, that, that this becomes a different way of thinking and it opens us to new ways of asking questions and new ways of making meaning. So with that, I hope again, some of you're all smiling. Some of you might be like done with smiling maybe frowning. Um, did it all show up? Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. It was great. It was great to hear you. Great to hear your, about your ideas and your creative process uh, of conceiving and flattening and all the other <laughs> discussions that you've made. Actually, it's a uh, I knew already, but it was striking to see how much uh the things that you that you that you talk about uh, match with the things that we think here in our um research group it's uh, oh, some of them, for example because we are we are actually uh, studying in a very abstract <laughs> in a very abstract layer of meaning in the meaning process so yeah. this means that we can tackle uh, subjects of whatever kind of language that we want. So we have students here working with comics, with the music, with uh, literature, with etc. Uh, etc. Et uh, with all the uh, all um, all of them working with the same methodology. So it's it, it's interesting to see. For example, when you talk about all these ways of approaching the page of a comic book, for example. Uh, so for us, this is very interesting. It's a, it's a problem in itself, yeah. and we usually talk about. Uh, we usually say that comics are very special objects, exactly for 
what you said, because as in, in our words, we would say it has a very uh, accelerated kind of uh, uh, process of meaning construction, because you have, as you said, a lot of things happening at the same time. Yeah. You see? So this is a kind of experience that the, 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 the artwork gives to the reader or to the whatever, uh, if it is music to the listener, if it is movies to the uh, whatever. Né? But uh, what I mean is uh, it's something that we tackle all the time and it's great to, to hear you um, giving a more, how can I say, concrete uh, um, discussion uh, of it. It's a kind of discussion that we do here in a more abstract way, but here you bring us a very concrete uh, path for us to think about the things that we, we discuss yeah. here. So it was great. Same. And I, let me say you one thing. I would love to be your student. <laughs> well, I, I would love to be your colleague. You'd be fun and, you know, it'd be more yeah. fun. But yeah, it's a, it's a fun... I wanted to say thank you. Um, I, I have my like I never read a comic out loud until I had children, right? Like it's not something you do. Um, but I've now made that an assignment for my students, like read a comic to somebody because it's such a weird thing, right? Like there's there's so much going on on the page. It it doesn't, you know, like it. But when you have to read it out loud, it starts to show you how strange comics are. So something you said in there made me think about it but anyway yeah yeah great but um okay now i will open to questions uh, from the audience uh bom eu, eu abro aqui uh, questões para vocês né para os participantes vocês podem fazer diretamente em inglês para o nick é, o que fica mais fácil mas se precisar de alguma ajuda também eu e outros aqui podem também é, ajudar a fazer a tradução tá então eu não sei, peraí, qual que é a ordem? É, bom, é, vou deixar então aqui. Bom, Ivan primeiro, Clarissa e Melina, tá? Por enquanto. Então, Renata, vamos... a Clarissa levantou a mão primeiro. Eu, deixa ela falar, depois eu. Ah, foi? Eu não tenho aqui, eu tô num, num, num tablet aqui, então... Por mim, tanto faz, professor, se quiser perguntar primeiro, tá bom. Uh, first of all, thank you, professor, for your lecture. Uh... I missed you in ECA in 2017, so it's my pleasure to be able to finally watch you talk about unflattening. And my thesis, my PhD thesis, thesis uh, it is about comic books, and actually it's about um, the editorial process in comic book making. So it was very interesting for me. Uh, first of all, one thing I wanted to mention, I can relate very much with you when you said that you came from mathematics and then you went to art. I came from art and, then, and now I'm in linguistics. You can bring them back together. Yeah. And it was very interesting because when you mentioned um, the history of uh, storytelling, I, I was thinking and how we started to tell our stories visually, right? Um, before the written text became the default. And I remembered some things such as the Narmer tablet and that the Egyptians made, um, mm -hmm. the Bayeux tapestry that McLeod cites in Understanding Comics and also the Lascaux drawings. And I... She... Eu vou chamar ela, só um segundo. Será que ela caiu? Oh, sorry. We are having all, okay. all kinds of... Okay. Back. Sorry, <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> I don't know when I went off. Just what you were about to tell us, you, you just, you, you said about the tablet, you were about to make your, your <laughs> thing and then it okay. went out. No, it's just that I remember other examples such as the Bayou Tapestry that McLeod mentions in right. Understanding Comics that are the Lascaux drawings. And I think those are very good examples of visual narratives that are on different surfaces other than the page. Yeah. Because the book has also become the default. And right. I wanted to listen to you because you mentioned a lot about the page and the, and the display of elements on the page, the layout. 
Um, mm -hmm. But I think that it's very interesting that for me, at least, comics are a much more malleable medium for storytelling in general. And that allows for more experimentation with the format and with the language. And I was thinking when you said, like, uh, when you talked about the the comics for blind people, immediately, immediately I remember the comic Life by Philip Meyer. Oh, yeah, that yeah. He, yep. That remember. he made the comic that was tactile. Yeah. And when you mentioned... Um, and when you mentioned Chris Ware, I remember building stories that it's one part of my thesis. And I also remembered uh, a Brazilian comic uh, comic artist called Luis G, that he made a, a comic called Borba Gata. And he made the comic, he drew over a mannequin. Mm. So you can read the body of the mannequin. I can show you a picture. And I wanted to listen to you about um, these layers of perception and of understanding and meaning that can come from also those surfaces. Right. Because we can think about the, the, the layout, the drawing, but we also can think about how uh, different surfaces allow for other ways of us to relate to the story, to read, to interpret the meaning and another and last thing um when you mentioned also the this part of uh perception i remember that neil Cohn uh, actually released an article i think it was this week called continuity co-reference and inference and visual sequencing mm. the, 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 Got them. the key moments keep getting lost I think they put the, the link for you, Nick. Oh, thanks. Oh, yeah. Here. Back again. <laughs> My camera is it's acting out. I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, I was you mentioning Neil's article, and then right as you said, right after Neil's article. Yeah. Kind of... Yeah, because uh, Neil Cohn actually studies the this cognitive part of right. reading, and he actually released an article. I think it was this week called "Continuity, Co-reference, and Inference in Visual Sequencing." I haven't had the pleasure to read it yet, <laughs> yeah. but I think it's very interesting because he studies this a lot, yeah. how we can have this, how the act of conclusion, as McLeod would call it, um, allows us to create new meanings from panel to panel and so forth. But I also think that these um, layers also come from the surfaces that we physically yeah. interact. I think that's. And I cool. wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Sorry, that was way too long. But... Well, you kept getting broken <laughs> Thank up. You. Um, that's really fascinating. I mean, you made me think of, I mean, definitely the development of the page as a thing. Like the page doesn't. There's a long time that the page isn't a thing, right? Um, the page doesn't exist, and then at some point, pages do exist, and so the the fact that this new constraint came in, which then generated other possibilities so the way the tapestry might be like comics it's not going to develop a bunch of the stuff that the page forced right the page would force things about rectangles and um which really i i've never thought about that uh, it's really interesting um i have one I, i'm not i'm not there's a bigger question i think that'd be fun to talk about um i think uh the, the the imagery that makes up my first chapter the marching figures it, it came from some things i'd made before and specifically i made a billboard uh a bill uh, does that word mean yeah you know, okay sorry uh -huh. um so in, in detroit where, where i was from um i made a billboard and my idea for the billboard was to to show these characters they, they came from thinking about car culture and how everybody was like on freeways and just sort uh -huh. of following in line um and uh, I wanted to show transformation on my billboard. And my initial thought was comics, right? Comics show transformation really well, one panel. But I was like, when you're driving up, you see them both at once. There's no, you're not reading, right? You don't read a bill. I mean, this is not how a billboard works. You, you kind of take it in. Um, so what I ended up doing uh, is that the billboard had a painting that was very similar to like the first page is this, 
marching figures on all these these roads um a massive painting like 20 some feet long um but as you drove alongside it so the billboard wasn't straight to the road it was on an angle to the road so as you drove alongside it on slats like this um but as you got alongside it the main painting disappeared and this uh -huh. other image on here showed up and it was the leaping figure that kind of looks like some things i did but in color so it was a it was a gray painting and then this leaping figure so i was taking the movement of the car right so you as you're driving alongside of it the thing would change um and, you know you get things like that in cereal boxes that that do it but uh -huh. um so you know like I, I realized comics was the wrong solution comics as i make them was the wrong solution there but something else was the right solution for me so i think you're uh you're really onto something like i mean i've seen students make we had jason shiga as a guest jason shiga makes these uh choose your own adventure and very experimental oh. kinds of comics he he came he, he's out here um, he came to my class once and then i had a student make his mini comic as a it was a it was like a it was like a quarter of a of a ring and then you unfolded it and made a full ring but then each you know so there was these other kinds of storytelling things that happened because of the folding and unfolding mm -hmm. and the shape right the shape the shape in contributed to it so I think you're really on to something. Um, I don't, I don't, I think just for, maybe we can continue this later. Um, I think for the sake of, I, would time, love I, to. I haven't thought about it, but you definitely challenged how I, you know, I, I, I do think so much about the excitement of the page, but clearly that's not true for, it's not true for the tapestry. It's not true for the mural version of comics. Um, and maybe not true for the t-shirt version of comics or whatever yours is right it's uh it's very particular to the i held it in my hands and i can turn pages um if the page is a different shape or the page has a hole in it or whatever like that's that affects a lot of things yeah that is great. um uh, i when you mentioned this i thought about here from Maguire. yeah uh, the graphic novel right, but they, right. Uh, it doesn't have, I think that doesn't exist anymore, but um, I remember that they yeah. also launched an app. Yeah. So it's a different experience. So it's more of a hypertext sort of thing yeah. rather the than app, the flippability that you mentioned. Right. I thought the app, and we should probably let other things go, but um, I thought <laughs> the app was much less successful than the book because like he thought about all the rhythms and things that the that worked so well in uh -huh. the in his original and in, in his book version but then when you could move it was fun to move the pieces around but it also i think it lost i don't know anyway i'll stop, I'll stop. <laughs> anyway like, we can continue this later i would love to thank you professor thank you so first of all uh, i'm but I'm so I'm so glad to uh, to have listened to your lecture. It was uh, overwhelming, uh, so so beautiful, so full of uh, inspiring ideas. I I I I could ask just a very tiny question. Yeah. Out of curiosity, rather, uh, uh, and it that's uh, that's. If drawing a comic page does something to our thinking, so in this process, can we distinguish between what comes what comes from the hand and what comes from the eye? Mm. Wow, um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's a great. It's, I don't, I can't answer that. Right. But, um, I can say, so, so the new work is supposed to be so much about thinking where ideas come from and how learning should incorporate the body and drawing. Right. Um, and, and I'll say there, cause I'm, it's been very slow for lots of reasons. Um, but, but there was a time like five years ago now where I really understood what I wanted to do. Like I had the like, I want to do this and I'm going to do this. I'm going to talk about this. 
And like, but it felt like a textbook to me. Like I, like I had all the ideas, but it didn't feel like my work, right? It felt like they're here. I, these are things I want to do, but they're not, they're not the right thing. Um, and I kept reading more and thinking more and reading more and thinking more and taking more notes. And I'm trying to make a book that's about how drawing is a kind of thinking or moving is a kind of thinking. But I kept reading more and thinking more. And so finally, yeah, you're laughing. You're right. Right. Um, I finally got my giant sheets of newsprint out that are, you know, I finally said, what am I? This is, you know, how I work. Um, and I, I just started, I said, forget it. I can't think anymore. I'm just going to start making marks and, and just see what happens. And so I made a bunch of stuff. And, and within half an hour, I noticed some other, some old comics of mine sitting around that, that sparked the Athena idea and, the, and then other things. And all of a sudden, all the stuff I'd been like trying to think through poured out on the page. And then I had this whole idea to tell an opening chapter to come back to Clarissa's question um, that is a tapestry, right? It's a 15, like I'm, I'm hopeful that we will also print a tapestry version of it. It's designed to work as a book, but it, but it is also a continuous image. And on that continuous image is a retelling of the Odyssey um, on a tapestry within this thing, like, but all and and so it talks about the creative process and it shows all these other things and it has a few elements that move backwards in time as the other story moves forwards in time and um all of that poured out in a i mean in about an hour and it wasn't until i sat down and started doing it which is partly the act of moving but it is also the act of seeing because i saw what my marks were right so i let me if, if you guys don't mind can i screen share for just a second I'm just doing it. Maybe. Go ahead. Go ahead. Come on. Come on. Oh, I got to. Sorry. There's an extra button I got to press. I, I showed this already, but um, this is this is a it's really hard to see it in any way. I, there's a video of it on I posted to Twitter if you want to see. But um, this this is not my figuring it all out. This, I mean, this is my sort of finish figuring it all out. But but a ton of it came out in that in that initial that's not the initial one either this is me trying to figure out the pages but but it really was not until i made those marks and like i i don't know i don't know why even when you're when you should know better um you still don't you know our default is to go back and think really hard about a problem and it's because that's that's just how we've grown up right we've grown up like thinking is something i do like this um so I don't, is that sort of an, I mean, I can't answer your question, right? Your question is too, too big, but just go with the flow. There you, there you go, Raphael. That, um, anyway, it's a delight. It's a delight to hear you. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, I, I, if you guys are interested in the blind, sorry, I'll, I'll add this to the, I'll add it to the chat. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm listening though. I'm, I just have to dig something up for you. Um, I will dig it up just because you guys are doing it. Did I lose you? No, no, you're here. Oh, okay. I'm just posting. So it's not, it's, this is our resources on blind comics for those of you who are interested. And then here's I'll also post the one that I made. And I'll just say one word about it since I'm posting. It is the least accessible comic. Like I made, I, I did everything I could to make it the most complicated visual comic with the idea that it would show how difficult comics are to, to, to make accessible. And so, you know, we're, we made this audio adaptation at the same time, but I really wanted to highlight how strange comics are um, and what a difficult problem it is, even if your comics aren't as strange as mine. Um, you know, even if you're adapting Archie comics, it's still a big challenge. Anyway, that's an aside, but. Next, Melina. Hi, Nick. Hi. I read your book a few years hey. ago and I love it. Oh, thank so you. So I, I have lots of questions. You can just bear with me. 
I will. It will be like four quick questions, but I mean, you had me thinking. Uh, when you say you're thinking with your hands and, and movement, it's a way to think about thinking. I couldn't help to wonder because I'm, I'm an architect and I study art. I'm an un undergraduate in art and architecture. Then I studied um, uh, at Fefeleche Letras, that is uh, language. And now I'm studying uh, geography and applying for a, a PhD uh, program in geography, cartography. So everything is knowledge. And your book uh, was a big blast in my life because, okay, I can show my professors, I can do it, we can do yeah. it. We need more of this. Um, I mean, uh, uh, when you think, architects has the saying, architects think with their hands. In Portuguese, it's like, arquiteto no uh, habisca, don't doodle, they engrave, they have uh, make a mark on the paper saying that the process of erecting a building or projecting a building uh, is made of drawings. Back in the days, I mean, now yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but, right, right. I mean, uh, I also knit and when I'm uh, um, having taken a lecture, I just think better if I'm knitting or crocheting. Yeah. So my question is, when you're processing uh, all the laser beams of uh, ideas to convey it in one product. What, what is your process? I mean, in, in a way, are you doing this standing, sitting or walking? Mm. Or because when I wrote my uh, BA, I had to have this uh, tall uh, uh, table mm -hmm. because I wouldn't submit my idea sitting and the computer engulfing me uh, just with the obligation to write. I mean, is, is it that uh, uh, walking and um, moving and uh, doodling and uh, making your hands active without drawing uh, specifically, is, is it a part of your process? That's great. Um, sometimes. Uh, yeah, I mean, boy, that's a, I mean, you're making me think I should do more of it. That's, <laughs> um, I mean, because I, I know, I mean, my time has been weird the last few years. Um, so I, I don't know that I always work the way I would. I certainly when I'm trying to figure something out, I might like draw a lot. Oh, okay. So I have a trampoline. <laughs> You didn't That's see that great. coming. Nobody saw that coming, did they? We have a trampoline. <laughs> my, my wife got it for an exercise thing and I, I use it. Um, and sometimes I will be working and I'll be a little stuck and I'll put out sketches. I'll have my monitor on where I'm like maybe working on the screen too. And my notes next to me. And then I'll jump on the trampoline for half an hour, but I'll be looking at stuff a little bit while I'm doing it. Um, I mean, I'm doing it cause I want to move, I want to exercise, right? Like, but I also want to keep thinking and usually something happens. I mean, r running is probably better for it cause the jumping is, <laughs> but it's, but I can see everything still, which I can't do. Um, so I definitely do those things when I draw on the newsprint, I, I now try to do it on a, an art desk, but I used to do it on the floor and I still do it on the floor. Some, uh, it partly it just, it's it hurts more now to do it on the floor um but it's but it's definitely better when i do it on the floor because i can put out a bunch of paper and i can get over the paper you know i can see it better i can move with it better um i think you'd like you, you must be familiar with linda berry's work yes that's yeah. that that will be my third question no all right you i had a passage from her in there like uh let me just i'll just bring it up because i can um, in, ah, come on, come on, go faster. Sorry. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. Don't worry, Nick. We are having fun here. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I, it's only so long you want to hang out. Um, where did it, it's up, up, up. It's right near the picture of my boy. Uh, where's that at? Somewhere around here. Oh, here we go. 
Oh, maybe I, no, no. Oh, well, it should be right here, but it's not here. Well, related to that, this Maxine Sheets John, Johnstone is a philosopher, doesn't seem particularly well known, but um, I really have liked what she said. But I have a version of this slide where it has Linda Berry's uh, passage, in motion you speak the language that language is based on. It's not on this slide for some reason. And I think about this, uh, this is my boy navigating chairs when he was nine months old. And I think how much, like how much he's processing, like he knows how big his shoulders are to weave through there. Like it's an enormous amount of things going on that you do without consciously doing it. And, and yet, you know, we go to school and we turn all that off and say, sit still. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I know enough to, to speak with that with any kind of authority, like, like, like somebody like Neil Cohn who studies those particular kinds of things, but I know it as a maker and a teacher. Um, anyway, Melina, you had more. Okay. The, the, the thing about Linda Berry is that she tells that, uh, everyone like decided to quit drawing uh, when they're about eight years old yeah. and you said a lot of, uh, about like uh how they don't know how to draw to know how to draw like if it's something that you learn to draw and then you draw or is something that you acquire in the process i mean um linda says that uh, the students that doesn't know how to draw that they draw the best they contribute a lot and you're you're saying a lot about um uh con constri constrictions constraints yeah and and art spiegelman doesn't know how to draw he always tells i don't know how to draw and the meta mouse yes i know the yeah, rhetoric yes but the thing is he didn't know how to draw and that was a limit for him to um came across a visual metaphor that uh, explained the dogs and the cats and because he wouldn't be able to draw the, his father in every um, detail. Right. So people know how to draw. Is there a knowledge to, to get when you're you, you ambitioning to draw this way and that person knows how to draw? Um. Lots of ideas. I'm not sure I totally followed the question, but um, the question is: uh, Is drawing a knowledge hmm. that people could acquire? Well, yeah, yes. I mean, I, I will say this. Uh, well, I have a bunch of responses, and then maybe that'll that we'll get to the whatever exactly. Um, I I find often my best students are the people who say they don't draw. Like you notice the two the two. I showed, I mean, I have very skilled drawers too. Um, and they're beautiful work, And but you have to spend more time with them. The, the ones that you saw like demonstrate comics really beautiful with almost nothing. Um, I think sometimes the drawers who come with skills are sort of trapped by their own skills. Like, oh, I know how to do this thing. And it's it's hard to let go of it. And I count myself among those. Right. Like I, I, and I don't think of myself as a great drawer, but I'm, I know how to draw in a very particular way. Like I, I draw things that look like things and it's really hard for me to not do that. Like I'm not a cartoonist, like, you know, I, the, the sort of exact, like I can't, it's, it's really difficult for me. I mean, I can copy, I'm very good at copying, but I'm not uh, like the sort of expressive cartooning. Um, that's just, it, it, I learned to draw reading 70s and 80s superhero comics, and that's that's kind of how I draw. Um, so, you know, some of the goals in my book was to have the later chapters where I'd shown you I could draw in the way that was acceptable, and then as it moved on, I would break free of that. But it's still difficult for me to not fall right back into that. And I think that is frequently the case with students uh, that they, the drawers are, are, can be more stuck. I think the beauty of doing fast collaboration, improvisational uh, constraint-based exercises is they have like two minutes, here's what you do, and then you got to pass it and the next person has to respond. Like those kinds of activities I watch really liberate students. Um, but I, but uh, sorry, I'll give you one more attempt at an answer. Um, I think the two that I, sh I shared um they both really understood comics and i think comics is a beautiful form because you can draw like 
you know, really lush, detailed things and make good comics. But you can also like, like I, I have, I do a picture list comics exercise where it's just about words. And so you just words and, and like sound effects and, and they do great with it. And I had a student who was really determined not to draw. She did a story for her final. Um, it was about domestic abuse, like her own personal situation. And it was, it stopped our class cold. It was so good um because she but it had no drawing in the ways we think of drawing at all none like none and it was great um but my final example and and i'm sorry if i don't answer this well we can follow up as well at another time i'll try um is uh i had a student he was a cross-country runner and he he was a he came he, he liked the class a lot he came all the time but he he, he made some pretty not good comics um and he kept making not good comics. And then finally we do, uh, we play with Matt Madden's 99 ways uh, to tell a story book. And I have them add a page to it, like try your own in a hundredth way. And he drew this one with Matt Madden as a Christmas tree. <laughs> and he found like just the right pen, uh, just the right pen, like just, like just, I don't ballpoint or a gel pen, or I don't know. And just the right, like super simple. It's not like he became a, a he didn't become Will Eisner, right? He didn't become, he be, he found a simple way of making his marks. And all of a sudden his comics went from, you know, like, all right, you made something. That's great. Cause I, I don't, all I care is that they make something. But he went from doing that to like, he found a thing that suited him. And mm -hmm. I think that that when I think of my students is find the ways like we do all like we do stuff with cutouts at the beginning. We do stuff with line making. We do uh, if you if any of you have seen my activity called grids and gestures, it's on my website. I, I thought we might do it today, but um, but time is what it is. Um, uh, I start with these very simple ways to to change what it what what it is that you think of as drawings. And I think if you start to understand that drawing. And, and certainly comics making um, is really about uh, making marks in space and making meaning of those marks in space. It, it opens you to so many possibilities, um, you know, that, that don't have anything to do with drawing noses that look exactly like a nose. I don't know, is that helpful at all? Yes, absolutely. Is that that, that bothers me because people um, put the thing, I don't know how to draw before anything. And sometimes they have great ideas and great ways of expression and they limit themselves to this thing that we decided that there's a good drawing or a bad drawing or a bad way yeah. to convey. The other thing that I, the, the, the couple of things that, that I wanted to know is, do you love James Joyce? Because it's a reference in, in your work in somehow, isn't it? Because you show uh, James Joyce page. I, I just missed what you do. I love doing. I just missed what you James said. Joyce. Oh, um, I, you know, I read that. I read that book um, in high school uh, and that page. I read it at the same time as I read Watchmen. And there's a passage in Watchmen about uh, when when if you've read it uh which one uh, uh ulysses odyssey well i read the ulysses right so i read ulysses but i read and i'll, I'll tell you the page and at the same time as okay so the, there's a passage in in you in ulysses about the what the did it flow and it talks mm -hmm. about all the things it's just turning on a faucet mm -hmm. and like that perspective of shifting to you know the taken for granted to oh my goodness what if we thought about all the things that go into every small action we make right and that that really triggered something at me and at the same time uh i had was reading watchmen and uh, i think it's chapter 10 or 11 um a silk specter has convinced dr manhattan to come back to earth to save it and 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 she has because she finds out who her father is and he says the unlike it, it's this little speech about the unlikeliness of your being like being that you exist right like of all the possibilities it's just you that you know it could have been anything else um and those two together like really like have resonated with me since um so it's something i always wanted to put into a comic and i finally got the chance i, I think that that's really what it is i'll show you i made a i'll show i'll share this in the chat um i made a comic about uh, an autobiographical or uh, comic about 
that that shows some of my readings is old and it's a little overly wordy um <laughs> for my current but, but finnegan's wakes uh i've never read it and it all about the flow and river run and going back the oh, really? oh, I, I have not read it i i i sorry maybe nobody I did so nobody the, did the, 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 Yes, the Finnegan's Wake, nobody did. But the, the first paragraph is about the Seristic Relation. It's very beautiful. It has all, uh, so much to do with the drawing that you sh just showed. All right. Well, I, uh, I'll put it on my shelf. Um. <laughs> and the last one is, what do you use? Which pen? Which paper? Is, does those things matter? Do you change scales? Uh, mm. yeah. Drawing little, drawing big? I mean, you told about big uh, sheets yeah for 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 ideas i use really cheap newsprint and i mean it's just right. you know it's as big as you know it's half my size right um and i use the pens that blow up on an airplane um <laughs> and when i and and so i'll do that for the chapters and big ideas and then for individual pages i use a grid notebook and mm -hmm. i just uh, i don't know what's a good and I just keep going and I keep trying to figure out how the pages work and where pieces go. And, and sometimes I have to move back to that. And then often I'll do, because it's hard to think about how much text is because I, I draw digitally. The comics okay. are actually, uh, it's drawn on the, that one was drawn on a, on my lap on a Wacom into into us. This one is drawn on a Cintiq. So I have a screen I draw on. Um, okay. But, uh, um, I often will do a test, you know, like start to lay the page out so I can figure out how much text will actually fit and then print and then draw on top of that and then rework. This is a, there's a lot of iteration, a lot. It's slow, but um, I like your other question, uh, knitting too. I saw, I visited Linda and she had all this stuff about mathematics and knitting at, at oh. Wisconsin. Um, anyway, perhaps to be continued if you, okay. if you want. All right. Thank, thank you. you so thank you, Nick. Uh, hello, Professor Nick. Thanks yep. for the lecture. Uh, I, in the beginning of your your lecture, you talk about the 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 writing text, the writing culture, in some way, as a way that in the academics, in the places where you began to go in as a way to frame the thought, frame the, the discussion, how to present the works, etc. And I remembered of uh, Michel Foucault when he talks about how power, uh, instance of power, control the space and control the circulation in the space as a, as a way to create uh, some sort of ideology or some sort of control. And my question is, do you think that the predominance in the later centuries of the writing culture, the, the writing culture, so the text, the thinking and writes, if in some sort that works similarly of what Foucault tells? So if we work, uh, if we live in a world where the knowledge and the cute and the knowledge and the the knowledge and the thought are tough. It's only valid when you put in words and you think and put in words again. If that is a, some sort of uh, if uh, dominates our culture, so avoid that we thought uh, or act in some other matters. I, I'm clear. Something I think almost. Oh, I mean, I don't, you, there's a lot of big things that you said, so I'm, I may just not be smart enough for some of that. Um, can, can you do it in a half sentence? Can you like, give me the shortest version and see if I made sense okay. of it? Uh, the fact that we read and use a text to communicate majority, uh, in the most of cases, it's some sort of control that society puts in our thoughts. Hmm. Melina says yes. Um, I, I I don't. I mean, I don't. That's really interesting. I don't. I, I thought. I thought the question was going a different direction. I had a very different response. Um, 
I mean, I certainly argued that that using only text limits us, right? Not not because it's bad. Like I think when I first would talk about my work, it would come out like I was anti-text, and I'm not at all. Like I I write, I, I read word books. I'm all I'm all for it. Um, it's just that why is that the only thing? And and you know, at least in this country, if you read comics as a kid, you got in trouble. If you brought them to school, you got in trouble, and that still happens. They're like, when are you going to read real things? I, I don't think that's what you're asking. Um, I think the other thing, and again, if it's not what you're asking, you can keep pushing me. Um, uh, well, let, let, me, let me show you guys something. If we'd done that activity together, which we didn't, and that's fine. Um, let me just, I think it's in the slides. Uh, just give me one sec. Um, so I do this exercise called Grids and Gestures, and I get them to make comics about their day in a, and I, I, I usually never share examples because I, I don't, these aren't great. I mean, these are great examples, but, but, but they have seven minutes to do this. Okay. So in seven minutes with my ambiguous instructions, they figure out. <laughs> ah. I have to tell that I love the, your dog, dog's participation. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's very nice. It's very cool. Porch. Um, uh, anyway, that, that the decisions that someone makes in seven minutes, like to choose to use dots or to choose to make scribbles, um, you know, what, these aren't actually necessarily made as fast as normal. These weren't like somebody said, what does your morning look like? And right away they figured out these things and they decided to have, uh, you know, this line terminate here. It, it, it's hard for me to explain it without. Let me just stop sharing. The point is, where, where are you guys at? I got to find you again. There you are. Um, the point is the decisions people make when they draw. Like you saw the decisions I make to link my multimodal page, right? Like that's a massive amount. But even the decisions they make when they make a, a seven minute activity that I have, I prompt them on is massive, right? Now, somebody could say, well, that's just like making a drawing. That's just simple. But it's not. It's not. You're like, why did you break the panel? You know, like a, a first year, you know, first time students never made a comic, not a drawer, does something where they have their final panel go off the page, right? Like, because my day isn't over yet. So I wanted to indicate that like they've already figured out in seven minutes that they can make that kind of decision. So I feel like this maybe goes more to the previous question, like the, the amount of thought that we are capable of that we don't even realize is thought right because we're so good at it like again my, the, my boy going through the chair legs or like he's so good at going through that space you don't realize like it takes an enormous amount of computing to do that but now you apply it to making marks it takes an enormous amount of stuff that you you know you dismiss as just scribbling right oh i'm just like drawing around so to try to come back to what I think is your question, which I, I think I'm just not, I'm just not there. Um, I think we've dismissed that work as like, well, that's just skill. Again, to come back to what I said at the start about talent, right? That's just talent or skill or, or some thing like that, but it's not actually thinking. And in fact, it is this massive amount of stuff. And, and I think by putting the emphasis purely on text, we don't see the kinds of connections and the kinds of ways people make meaning through image. And I, to come again back to the other question, it's not about making meaning through image as good drawers. It's about making meaning through images as using space. Like the, the people who did the Paleolithic lunar calendar, those aren't good drawings of the moon in the technical sense, right? But they make meaning of space through the shape of the moon and through how they've arranged them. So. Does that answer anything or was it even moderately relevant or moderately interesting? No, yeah, it's kind of that. I, I was asking about that in the sense of uh, how society, what society wants the people think or how wants the people think when, privilege, uh, when chooses text over image. Yeah. It's sort of that, but well, you're. But if I if I can try to help, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, well, a new uh, thought, tell, tell me if I'm wrong, Lo. Uh, but uh, what I understood from your question is that you were 
asking Nick if it was possible to draw a parallel between the idea of Foucault, Foucault's idea of uh, the controlling power of institutions and the controlling power of words in terms of shaping society. Is it something like that, Leo? Yeah, something like that. Thanks. Was it something that you uh, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. Like, I don't, I don't, I think that's a, a philosopher of a higher, far higher standing than me should, should tackle it. But I, but I do have this last bit of an answer and I'm, I was a big fan and she cited a couple times in, in the work of Susan Langer, who a philosopher wrote a lot about the arts and I, I think it's referenced in there, but I'm not sure. Um, she talks about, you know, we tend to dismiss images as the irrational because we don't quite know, we don't know what to make of them, right? Like, like text fits into this nice structure, but images, the images, you know, like I, I tried it in there where like you can diagram a sentence. It's really hard to diagram a picture. Like where does the picture start? The sentence has a start and you can, you know, so if it's in terms of school, just because that's the things I think about the most, um, like evaluating your grammar or your sentence structure is is pretty straightforward, but evaluating your thinking on a on a drawing is a different it's a different thing. So I, I I don't think it's intentional form of control, right? I don't think people are. I mean, we've been anti-image in some ways for a long time, or dismissive. You know, images are both kind of like scary and dangerous, but also don't mean like like it's both of those things, right? Um, I, I don't feel, I mean, I don't know. I don't think it's an intentional thing. I think it's, it's, we understand how to deal with text. We don't understand well how to deal with image and we've left it over. I mean, this is the last point and then move on or, or uh, uh, you know, you can, you can say, well, you can't say that I can't write or I can't read, right? Like you can't be in a grown up and not be able to read or write. You can be a grown up and say, I can't draw. I cannot draw. You can be a grown up and also say, I can't do mathematics too, right? Those are both things you can get away with. So I feel like those are things humans do, right? Like humans make images. And I, I think the fact that we we've let people say, well, I just don't that's just not I'm not skilled at it. I the quit at eight years old, like we were talking about before. I, I think that's a failure of what you can do with drawing what you again, not everybody's going to draw noses that look like noses. That's not drawing. That's a kind of drawing. Not everybody's going to write like James Joyce, but that doesn't mean I can say I can't write. Right. Um, so I, I feel, I mean, I guess this comes back to unflattening specifically. I feel like school as a kind of, here's a particular way things are supposed to be, can, can really limit of how things could be, um, in terms of what we think of as, you know, I mean, I, I, I had students last semester tell me they don't like to read and it's college class. I'm like, what do you mean? You know, like, and it, and I was annoyed at first, but I was also really like disheartened because I feel like the kinds of reading and the kinds of things they had to do around reading in school were made them not like reading, right? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of controls of school because they're like, we want you to meet these kinds of standards that then kill your love of the thing that you should love. Like who doesn't love reading? Like, what do you mean? You don't want to, isn't there, like you may not like reading this kind of book, but what, what do you like? And she's like, I don't like reading. I'm like, I'm watching you on your phone. You're reading something. Right. Like there's clearly stuff they like, but but they're so convinced of it. So I don't know. We're sprawling beyond your question. And I didn't answer your question because uh, anybody time somebody takes up a big theorist of those sort, I realize that I don't know enough about it that I, I should just keep quiet. <laughs> OK, but I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for I mean, they always make me think of stuff I don't know. So it's helpful, really helpful. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Nick. And I think we are heading towards the end. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I have a curiosity, if you allow me, because uh, in the beginning, the very beginning, and in the beginning of the flattening as well, you you uh, mentioned uh, this idea that learning is done with it's a kind of the student is a kind of box. Like learning is doing is is done by boxing. 
um, knowledge in in the students or something like that and it is it strikes uh, what strikes me is that it's very similar it's a very similar idea to what um, Paulo Freire is. Have you ever heard of Paulo Freire? Yeah, he's an educator. There, isn't he? oh, the banking of concept of education. Yeah, it, he's in there somewhere. Oh, he's in there. Oh yeah, he's I, great. I it, I, yeah, because um, it's it's very it, it's very similar. It's a I very think similar. He's in, um, I think he's in chapter seven. Uh, I think he's near uh -huh. the end of chapter seven. Um, there's a there's a there's a, a thing poured into the head. Um, I think it's near the end of chapter seven. I, don't, I didn't remember that, but uh, yeah, because it's, a, it's exactly, it's, oh, a, very, no, a, little bit it's a very cool translation of his ideas. And it, it's yeah, good no, to see he, that he's there also. It's he made a big how impact. I, um, <laughs> uh, keep going, keep going, Melina. I can see your, keep going, keep going. No, no, it's, uh, it was like, yeah. it was uh, Oh, no, you're right, because, right, I couldn't see. Yeah, isn't it there? Isn't it referenced there or no? No? Okay, now I gotta look. Hold I, on. I, don't, I didn't remember this that you quoted specifically him, but um, yeah, I've read the true. I've read them Flatley like three years ago or something. But yeah, well, I, <laughs> but anyway, it uh, what what I what I was saying is that it's very interesting to see how wide is Paul Freire's range because I mean people from all sorts of backgrounds and etc can uh, interact with his ideas so it, this is yeah very, oh he it's I, really I, cool to see. I have a very well read copy of his book um and his and and my 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 uh one of my advisors this maxine green she was friend like he was at her house in years past um boy i know that i know that i'm referencing maybe i don't use his name in there but i'm pretty sure somewhere in here yeah, perhaps I I didn't well, remember that. If I didn't, I mean, if I didn't, I, I didn't remember. I but apologize anyway. to all of Brazil for leaving his name out. Um, uh, yeah, he's in there. I, I'm and the uh, man from India, um, is friends with Einstein. Uh, uh, tag ta uh, Tagalor, uh, Tagor, Tagor is also. Yeah. I don't know where you're at. What did page you on? Oh yeah, Tagor, yeah. 177. Uh, pedagogy uh, pedagogy yeah, but, do oprimido. But I, I'm pretty sure, well, if I, anyway, the banking model was definitely big on my mind. Um, so. Very cool. Oversight if he's not actually cited. Very, very cool. Okay, so I think uh, the, the last comment that I will do, and then we, unfortunately for us, we have to go. <laughs> but, I'd love uh, to talk with you all more. It's really yeah, fun. It, it, it's really, it's really been a very pleasant and fun <laughs> even, um, afternoon for us. But uh, Nick, it was very interesting to see how, uh, when you were saying how important is the role of movement in comics, and then uh, the very then you mentioned the very different ways to treat time, uh, as we can see, in the pages of comics and etc. And then right after you say, it's uh, the comics is a space oriented medium, <laughs> and uh, when you were uh, and you, you said that when you were talking about the this this very interesting idea of how the space gap between panels uh can uh, means different uh, time left uh, time time um, uh, uh, I, I forgot the word that i wanted I but mean, different but... times different times different time settings right so right. Uh, with that in mind is it is it comics really a space oriented medium medium isn't it a time space oriented medium or something oh. like that? Oh, you because it's a time slide. space oriented thing uh, because you translate time in space and space in time all the time because the gaps between the panels okay it's a space but it's a space meaning time it's a time gap okay. so it, it's something like that and and with that in mind i have to tell you a secret uh oh because this talk 
was actually a trap for uh -oh. you. <laughs> because uh, what, what I mean by that, um, as I said today, and and as you were going to answer this or comment this that I have just uh, said, I think we have so many things that we could uh, perhaps uh, go on or uh, share. These are things that we share in terms of um, uh, interests. So perhaps this could be a, a, a good, as I said, trap in terms of a starting point for us to talk further about I hope so. things because uh, many there was there were many striking things uh, in your presentation that I can see that that a direct link with the discussions that we develop here in our group. So anyway. That was it. But I don't know if you want to make any comment about what I've um, said before. Let me let me just quickly thank you. I hope I mean I don't I, I don't have a lot of colleagues that have anything to do with comics where I'm at. So um, I have a lot of students, but uh, let me share one thing based on what you said. I know we're trying to go, and I gotta I gotta write a new class today, so I don't know. Um, Okay, so my one of my favorite books on relativity, my, my dad's a physics teacher, so um, is by Lewis Carroll Epstein's um, Relativity, Relativity Illust, uh, I think it's Relatively Visualized, um, something like that. And he, he says here, why can't you travel faster than light? The reason you can't go faster than the speed of light is that you can't go slower. There's only one speed. Everything, including you, is always moving at the speed of light. How can you be moving if you're at rest at a chair? You are moving through time. So, you know, here's time, here's space. And if you're going, if you're going really fast, you only move through space. And if you're going not moving, you only go through time and you go somewhere through it. And I, I share this with my students. Let me see if there's another. Um, that I think comics do fit somewhere on because they are, you know, they they are not a time-based medium like film. They clearly are not. Um, but they're not without some reading in them you know painting a painting i think would would not move through time right you, you take it in however the comics are somewhere in here um i haven't drawn a diagram properly for that this is taken from the from that book but but that that continuum between them um seems really important to me so um yeah i haven't done more with that than than that slide but uh i thought about it Okay, so this could be a first step. For there you us go. To think about it together. There you, you, <laughs> you know, that it was a trip. <laughs> no, the best gift of of having made this thing is a, a lot of people ask me. The it's mostly non comics people who I talk to, but you know, they ask me how you've become unflattened, and I'm very sort of I like I that's that's my least favorite use of the word. Like it's it implies something finished right and and it's i'm very careful to say unflattening like it's a i don't i don't know how it translated i don't know what, if that's a planar also continues no, it's very definitely. it's very important to me that it's not a finished thing it's an ongoing thing um but i but what's really true is every time i talk to people about the work there's all these things i never thought of that really helps me think about other stuff so I, i'm just really grateful um it's it's a real gift and thank you. Well, we are very grateful, very honored yeah, and, uh, to have you here with us. Uh, it was a very rich and pleasant, very big, ple really pleasant uh, after, uh, evening for us. Oh, and uh, no, afternoon, afternoon, yeah. afternoon. To, now it's, uh, it's 4 p.m. So right. it's afternoon. And uh, yeah, I, I just thank you and hope that we can go further on <laughs> in other in other moments, and we can. I hope we can just move on with this discussion and bring together our ideas and etc. Because the group here works with many things that can uh, link directly with your way of thinking. In, a, in in a, in a, in general ways. So thank you very much, really, in the name of the group. 
And um, now I just want to give a very short um, information for the people that are here because we are going to have another uh, FAPS in October. Nice. And uh, the, the professor uh, Amir Bigladi from Sorbonne University is, I, I'm talking in English, well, okay, from Sorbonne University is going to give his talk about uh, which is which uh, the title is para uma semiótica aberta desafios e perspectivas for an open semiotics uh, challenges and perspectives something like that <laughs> so um it's uh, the last friday of um october so everybody's invited as well okay so nick thanks again and hope to talk to you soon <laughs> hope so i look forward Okay. Wow, so, that was lovely. Hi. Obrigada, gente, por estar aqui com a gente essa tarde. Essa tarde, não noite. <laughs> então, a gente se vê no próximo FAPS. Tchau, tchau, gente. Acho que pode parar a gravação, né, Léo?